Hello. This is the time in the class where we talk about the American Revolution. And it is a long lecture, so it will spread over two weeks. You have um, the lecture that is posted here, and you have two weeks. This week, where we talk about the revolution, the people who made the revolution, and the ones that they fought against, John Adams on the one side and Jonathan Sewell on the other side. And then next week, we'll talk about the young republic as it found its shape and as it was being shaped by those founders like Alexander Hamill, who, of course, has recently received his due by being made the namesake and star of a Broadway musical produced and written by Lin-Manuel Miranda, who you might have heard about. The American Revolution is such an artifact in American life. It seems to be set in stone. There is a simple narrative that is taught from primary school onward that it was us against the British. And we, that is to say the Americans, the colonists, wanted our independence and our freedom and our right to be free from British taxation. We fought a war, we won, and we got what we wanted. This is a gross simplification that ends up being really mostly wrong about everything. Like all revolutions, the American one was messy, and very few people who went into it as participants agreed on what they wanted, and very few people, if any, wanted the outcome that they got. So people with different interests and conflicting notions of political ideas go into these events, they fight with each other and against each other, and then in the end you get an outcome that is shaped by military forces, political ideas, and of course social class. So I want to try and untangle this, and therefore I'm going to go to the lecture slides here, where the main argument that I want to make is that, first of all, we want to understand the American Revolution not as a monolithic event, but rather as four conflicts that happened in sequence. And that these conflicts are best understood if we consider what class interest informed the different parties that participated in the struggle. The outcome of the whole process at the end of these four phases of the revolution was that you get a republic that is governed by merchants and large landholders to the exclusion of everybody else. And that you get a system of laws and institutions that benefited capital and the development of a capitalist society. That is still pretty revolutionary, all of that, a republic as opposed to a monarchy, capitalism as opposed to the moral economy of old, but it's not the only option that there was in the beginning, and by no means is the outcome assured. First, they could have lost. Second, they could have gotten a different kind of republic in the end and a different kind of society. So who wanted what in this revolution? Who are the people who played a role? It's useful to distinguish at least four main groups. First, you have the crown, which is to say the king of Britain. The king and the parliament in Great Britain share sovereignty. And parliament, too, takes very seriously this concept of sovereignty, as you recall, which means that you get to govern a certain territory and the people in it, and you have a right to govern that territory and those people and defend that right against challenges from below, which is to say from your people, and outside, that is to say other countries. With the crown were not just the British, as in people who lived in Great Britain, but many royal officials in the colonies, people whose bread was buttered with the crown, who were judges, policemen, administrators, post office, um, directors and so forth. The next big group to consider is the colonial elite. Everybody in the colonies who was doing well and who was economically powerful. 
And that colonial elite can again be distinguished into merchants and landlords. And they have diverging interests. Um, merchants obviously want a as, as free as possible a trade. Um, in some cases, this is also true for landlords. Um, however, for the most part, in the end, once you get a republic, once they get to set their own policy, these two groups clash over the question of just how much imported goods get to be taxed. The bulk of the colonial population that is white consists of urban artisans and laborers in the cities. And then on the countryside, many small farmers, but also quite a large group of people who work in the countryside for wages. That is to say, um, the bulk of the population there, you do get people who have their own property, many more than you do in Europe. Land ownership is a little more equal in the new world among white people. Uh, but then of course you have another large group which is composed of the colonial other, slaves, especially in the South, but not exclusively. Every state of the Union, <clears throat> or of the colonies rather, every colony is a slaveholding one. And Native Americans, who are also still a formidable group. And as you saw, their influence, the perceived threat of Native raids and Native claims to the land was an important part in the way that the Seven Years' War was fought. And the British prohibition on moving into Indian territory, into native land, was one of the grievances that the colonists felt they had after that Seven Years' War. What do these groups want? The Crown, including the Parliament, wants to defend sovereignty. That is to say, they argue that they have a right to tax and make laws for the colonists, and any discussion about what kind of laws and how much tax and on what kinds of things must begin with the acknowledgement that the crown and the parliament have the right um, to make these decisions. The colonial elite is the first group that disputes that right, who are saying, we do not believe you get to levy taxes on us because under the British constitution, one must be represented in order to be taxed. And Parliament argues that they virtually represent us, but we do not in fact have any delegates, any members of Parliament in Westminster. So we are not in fact represented and we are being taxed without representation. And it's a matter of our rights as Englishmen that we get to be asked for our um, contribution, for our opinion when it comes to raising taxes. The colonial population for the most part, that they become politically active, has an interest in freedom from exploitation. Whether this is a matter of wanting more rights against that traditional masters, the craftsmen, the landlord, and so forth, or whether it's already a question of working for wages for a merchant or other entrepreneur, the colonial population has a sense that they are being exploited and that a lot of the money that they earn by their labor ends up in somebody else's pockets. And it looks a lot like those pockets are located in London or Liverpool. Finally, for the colonial others, slaves and Native Americans, freedom from slavery and conquest would be the main issue. So when the slaves hear that all men have rights and are created equal, they of course consider this to be a direct challenge to the system of slavery in which they exist. And if there is a right to self-determination, then perhaps Native Americans would pick up that idea and argue that yes, they do have the right to determine their own political space in the places that they have inhabited traditionally. So the Iroquois Confederacy is a big part um, of that. <clears throat> 